Welcome everybody, my name is Mark Taylor. I'm a master chair for Vistage, the uh, world's leading CEO membership organization. I'm here in New York City and uh, Insperity is a sponsor. In fact, we're having our big Vistage Executive Summit on uh, Monday and I think you'll be doing another program on Monday. And my contact and friend has been Sal Gervasi, the uh, district manager for Insperity here in New York, and you brought some great guests to our meeting, some experts to answer questions on returning back to the workplace. Do you want to introduce them, Sal? I would love to. So um, I'll start with, with Aaron Lau. Aaron works with uh, me out of the Midtown Manhattan office. Well, <laughs> someday will work with me out of the Midtown Manhattan office. Uh, is the uh, manager of our service team, or one of our service teams. We have about five service teams service, uh, serving the uh, tri-state area. Erin uh, has been 15 years devoted her career to human resources. She, as I said, is currently manager of HR services uh, for us. And prior to Insperity, Erin uh, held various HR management positions in retail and professional services. And actually for some of my favorite retailers, as, the, as a matter of fact, uh, she's been an active member of SHRM for more than 15 years. Uh, she has held several leadership roles, including serving on the on the board of directors for uh, a few nonprofit organizations. Um, is, it, Erin is gone back to back. I think she had about 20 minutes in between um, the Zoom presentations today. Um, Andy, Andy Ramsell is uh, Inspirity's Vice President of Property and Casualty Services since 2017. Uh, he is based in our headquarters in Kingwood, Texas, just outside of Houston. He oversees our Insperity's National Employer Risk Management programs, including workers' compensation program management, risk financing, captive management, safety and loss prevention, and claims management, <clears throat> along with Insperity's Employment Practice Liability Insurance Program Management. Uh, and he has been a litigation attorney for over 25 years, and he led Insperity's Internal Employment Law and Litigation Practice Group from 2007 to 2017. So welcome. We're glad to be here. Me too. And, and you, as you can imagine, these two individuals have become extremely popular these last three months and have been working very, very, very long hours uh, you know, directly with our clients as well as doing the various webinars and, and, and uh, reach outs to the small business community ourselves. I'm right. going on mute now. Okay, so we're going to have a short presentation that Andy's going to give, and then I have some questions that were submitted uh, when you registered for the program, but you're welcome to chat in any questions that you have. And even though it's a return back to the workplace was our original focus, as Aaron and I were talking, there's a lot of questions and concerns coming up about some of the civil unrest that we're experiencing. So I'm open to any questions that will serve you. Um, our, our purpose is really to help you become better leaders, make better decisions, and in this time, I can't think of a better time to have a, a peer group to help you through this. So go ahead, uh, Andy. Sure, let me, and this is always that moment, is my screen being shared? It is. Good, good. Yeah, good job. <laughs> this is always the first hurdle, did I get that part right? right. Um, um, so we wanted to talk a little bit this afternoon. Um, I'm, we're going to start with some survey results. Um, Sal or Aaron, do you want to talk about the survey itself and the results? Sure. So uh, we surveyed our, our client base. We had about 550 respondents. And uh, we discussed this yesterday when, when, you know, doing the final prep for this meeting. And, um, said, wow, like this is tailoring directly right into uh, the reasons we're getting together to chat today. So top concern, as you would well imagine, is sustaining through the economic slowdown. Um, we will leave that in, uh, you know, up to you, knowing your individual businesses. But we really, if, if you look at it, employee well-being and mental health is the second with 64 of our respondents uh, calling that a top concern. And return to work considerations and workplace safety, 50% of the respondents. Now, I would say locally, in the last week, uh, those numbers would probably be much higher uh, in terms of their respondents being top concerns. 
just to quickly go through it, employee engagement and sustaining relationships and culture, 47%. Innovation, rethinking our business model, uh, 39%. Staying current regarding policy changes for employers, 35%. Meeting terms for loan forgiveness, 33%. Changing skills and capabilities required by uh, or for employees, 15%, and meeting increased demand for uh, products and services, 14%. And that's what I guess we will all wish uh, we are, were higher on. So uh, with that said, um, you know, again, Andy and Erin will be covering number two and number three. And, you know, again, we had already prepared for those two. It just came to light that how impertinent that would be at this particular time. And Sal, the people that you surveyed, are they CEOs and what size companies uh, were involved in the results? Our primary contacts are CEOs, that's correct. Um, and it could be, it, did you say what kinds of companies also, Mark? What size are these? So like it's what size? Well, we service primarily the small business community. Um, so they could be from five employees. Our, our largest bid market client is about 3,000 employees. So pretty broad range right there, but it, you know, could be anywhere in that, um, in that group. I would suspect most would be in the uh, 30 to probably 100 employee size range. Great, thank you. I'm going to move on just to confirm the screen did just change, didn't it? Yes. Good. Okay. Um, I'm going to um, sort of go to some nuts and bolts issues, if you will, um, that every employer as they begin to reopen their workplace is going to face. Um, many of these, there are a variety of sources at the end. Um, I, I will give you a link. Uh, to, to many of the, the sources that I talk about during this conversation. A lot of these are uh, pretty common sense. Some of them are a little bit, uh, can be a little bit different and, and you, you very well may have questions um, at the end that, that we're happy to talk about. Um, you know, I, I guess starting at the top of the circle, um, and, and by the way, in Sparity, I'm right now standing in my office um, as Mark said when we began, um, our corporate offices are on the outskirts of Houston. Um, Houston has had a fairly good trend of late. We have been having uh, about 25% or no more of 25% of our physical capacity um, moving back in on a, a I'm not going to call it a full-time basis. Many people are back two or three days a week. Um, now for a couple of weeks, um, we, we are putting in place plans to move toward a 50% reoccupancy um, later in the summer, 75% moving back toward whatever the new normal will be. Um, again, sort of going back to the, this particular graphic, one of the things that we have found in that process, um, it is very important to train and to communicate with your employees. Um, to, to train them in what is expected to be different in their behavior once they're in the workplace. Um, you know, the, the, the area that we've all encountered the most um, and at times can be the most challenging is how do I maintain a six foot buffer? And if I don't, um, do I need to be masked? If I am masked, when in my normal workspace should I be masked? Um, again, much of that can be individual circumstances that are dependent on a particular work uh, uh, geographic, how, how it is laid out. Um, the, the, the second, moving to the one o'clock position, screening employees, um, you know, the, I think the most important thing is making sure that people understand if they are showing symptoms um, to stay at home if they start to exhibit symptoms at work that they should go home. I, I think the number one um, uh, suggestion that people can give is to the extent you have someone who may be showing symptoms to, to move them out of the population of people who are asymptomatic. Um, it, it's, not a, it's not perfect, but, but that can be one of the best early ways um, to, to try to limit the spread internally. Uh, moving uh, down to four o'clock, the clean and disinfect. Um, that, that is, it, it, I, I will say the CDC um, over time has had 
different statements about the level of cleaning and disinfection needed. Um, they have begun to emphasize the statement that the primary way COVID-19 appears to be spread is through uh, essentially face-to-face -face contact and air or droplets leaving one person and hitting the mucous membrane of another person. Um, that it is not, it does not appear to spread nearly as much from hard surfaces to someone else. It, it can spread that way, but that's not the primary way that it's spread. Um, but on the cleaning and disinfecting, um, you know, there are a number of EPA approved disinfectants. Um, EPA is maintaining a great website with long lists of approved disinfectants that you can use. Again, at the end of this, uh, I'll, I'll give you a link. Um, you know, I, I will tell you internally, we have stepped up the amount of cleaning and disinfection in common areas of our workplace. Um, you know, many doors that historically have been closed now have wedges in them that are propping them open so that people aren't forced to grab and open and close doors as much. Um, again, just trying to think through as I go around my ordinary day, how do I limit what I might touch that might be holding this virus? Um, social distancing, you know, we, we've all had deep lessons in social distancing. Um, it, it, it is, I will tell you from experience now, it is somewhat challenging to maintain space and social distancing among a group of colleagues that you've worked with for a long time. Um, again, I have all of my leadership team uh, are back in. In some ways, we were acting as guinea pigs for the last few weeks, trying to understand on a practical level how these would work. Um, and, and that has been a challenge. Um, it is challenging to get people moving to protective equipment who know one another and trust one another to wear masks if they are going to be uh, within six feet of each other. Um, it, it's when you're among the general population, the general public, and you don't know them, that is not as hard. Inside your own office, that can be much more difficult. And then finally, business travel, um, you know, that, that is geographically dependent. There are some places that travel um, functionally isn't very possible right now, but, but many uh, groups, um, and in fact, Judy, I think you mentioned, um, you know, it, being in the hotel business, I would love to understand um, you know, your experience as you reopen to business travelers and what that may be. We are all sort of experiencing um, a, a new normal on that. Um, I'm going to skip over this one and come back to it for just a second. Erin, you want to talk just a little bit about culture? Sure, absolutely. Thank you. Uh, you know, in going back to the survey results, when you look at the number two uh, concern uh, amongst the, the population that was surveyed, it was that employee well-being. And, you know, the, the way to um, address that is to thoroughly communicate to your teams what the plan is. You know, if people are educated and people are aware and, and brought in into the loop on, on what the plan is or what the changes are that have been made, they're much more at ease. And that's the first step is the, the communication um, and, and simply put over communicating. The more you can bring your employees into the know per se uh, regarding your safety guidelines and the expectations of how they are to conduct themselves, the, the better off this transition back into the workplace will be. Um, you know, this has been an emotional time period for many of our employees and, and COVID-19 has impacted some employees more so than others. And so as a, a business owner or leader, we need to, you know, we need to be empathetic to that and, and lead with that heart and empathy and understand that there's a a, a wide range of feelings around this process and and adjust and pivot to those individual feelings. Um, you know, our recommendation is to solicit feedback and, and ideas straight from your employees. Let them feel a part of this decision to come back. Um, you know, what we've done internally at Insperity is, is to go as far as to get a pulse through survey to our entire employee base to understand what are their thoughts, what are their concerns uh, coming back into the workplace and really get some fact-based 
information from your team so that you're not just operating on assumption. It allows you to have a roadmap to create what's the best plan for your organization. Is there a trend in specific departments that are more concerned than others? It'll help you navigate by having that direct feedback and your employees will feel that you're taking this seriously and you're really weighing into consideration what their thoughts and concerns are. Um, you know, definitely I look to identify and implement areas that must evolve to meet the employee's needs. So there is the potential that there you know, may be concern around public transportation. Well, is it truly essential that that employee returns to the workplace? Are they in a role where they've operated successfully? And I, I think this was one of the questions that came up. Are they in a role that's operated successfully at home for the last couple of months, but, but you'd prefer them to return to the workplace? It's the understanding for the employee why. Why do they have to truly return? Is it because that's what they've always done? Or is there a true business case and need for them to return to the workplace? And it, it, you know that, that why and the explanation to the employees is gonna be really critical in getting their buy-in. Um, creating opportunities for cross-team collaboration is a great idea to get some new exposure. There could potentially have been Im impact to the organization where you have had to make layoff decisions or reduction in, in certain departments. And that can impact the overall organization. That can impact how certain departments have worked and collaborated with other departments. And so it's a, essentially a back to basics and kind of start from the ground up in terms of the, the cross team. Um, you know, we cannot stress enough in these conversations the, the emphasis to be open, creating an open door policy and, and inviting your employees to come in and share with you their real life concerns. Um, and just listening. You don't have to have an answer for them right away. I know Andy referenced the fact that you can ask about symptoms. You can, you can be a bit more inquisitive and, and inquire more so than we're used to or that we're comfortable and that's new. Um, but the more you can put out on the table the real concerns and what's going on and ask about symptoms and come up with plans, um, the, the better off and the, you'll be in the long run and the less risk uh, to the organization. I think next slide, Andy, maybe. Yep. Um, apologize, I just need to move it. <laughs> These are, sure. go ahead. Thank you. So just to, you know, to, to emphasize that over communicating plan, uh, again, tying it back to those survey results, you can see the trend. Um, employees will likely feel much more comfortable if there's the trust in the leadership that this is a well thought out process, that the, the organization is committed to adjusting their practices and in turn asking for the employees buy in to, to adhere to those practices. Um, you know, training, as, as Andy said, the tactical education behind it to ensure that everybody has heard the same message and everybody is committed to maintaining a safe workplace will ease that angst that employees may be feeling. Yeah, I think the, the way to anticipate some of those needs sends a really strong message to your employees. Are there employees on your team that might have childcare concerns? Can you come to them before they come to you and say, We'll figure it out. I know you're home for the summer, or I know there's the possibility in New York that schools may reopen and look different than they have in the past. So putting the employee at ease that we'll come up with a plan, uh, providing resources, perhaps an employee assistance program of sorts where uh, you can seek childcare options for the employees, just going that extra step to add the, the human element to it. Um, is, is very well received and that's feedback that, that we consistently see within the way that our uh, clients are, are communicating to the employee base, it, it definitely goes a, a long way. I'm going to back up a couple of slides. Um, one issue that has come up uh, as uh, businesses reopen, um, at, at times employers, business owners ask the question, well, if I reopen, am I opening myself up to, you know, a significant amount of liability? Um, and, and there have been some headlines I've seen in news articles um, that, you know, sort of have what I'm going to call the scare tactic headline. 
Um, as a general rule, um, and, and I, I, you know, each case is going to be different. It's going to depend on what state you're in. It's going to depend on the particular facts. But as a general rule, as a business owner, with respect towards your employees, um, it, you are very protected by the workers' compensation system that exists in every state. Um, so long as you don't intentionally injure an employee, the, the employee's only avenue of seeking redress if they were to, to um, re, uh, it be infected by COVID-19 at work would be through the workers' compensation system. And so long as you've bought workers' compensation insurance, um, you, you, your insurance company is going to be the entity that's liable for that. Um, it, again, that is a state by state. Every, every state's comp system is a little bit different. Um, the, the, what I'm going to call the fringe issues in Texas or California may be different than those in New York. I can essentially say in New York, there are very few loopholes for an employee to, to somehow sue an employer for a workplace injury outside of the workers' comp system. Separate than that, um, in most comprehensive workers' comp programs, if they were to file a lawsuit anyway, trying to get around it, there is another form of coverage that is often part of that program known as employer liability coverage that would pick up the cost of defense um, for those kinds of claims. Now, there are certainly some uh, categories of employees that may have an easier time uh, asserting a compensable workers' comp claim. We've heard stories about first responders, medical and personal care providers, nursing home workers, place, uh, individuals who, because of the nature of where they work, um, there may be a presumption that if they uh, were to come down with COVID, um, that it would, it would be presumed that it happened in their workplace. But again, from the employer stance, um, that, that is really a workers' compensation carrier issue and, and something for them um, to, to take care of for you. Um, separately, if you, on the third party side, there's always the potential um, for your general liability policy to, to pick that up at the same time. Again, I, I, I just wanted to bring up the topic because I've, I've heard people ask it. It's, it's a valid concern. Let me say, in terms of running your business, this shouldn't be the concern that stops you from reopening. So, Andy, yes, I have seen a couple of questions on this. And when you said from a third party concern, somebody who sends photographers to schools wanted to know if there was a you know, is this something their general liability would cover for them or what implications are there if you're working in somebody else's facility? Sure, I, let, me, let me take that two ways. Um, if you sent a photographer into a school and the photographer were to um, come down with coronavirus, with COVID-19, um, there is the potential that that photographer could make a workers' compensation claim, assuming that that, that illness was uh, taken in during the course and scope of their employment, they could assert, make that assertion. Now, let me say, it's still a fairly high bar whether or not that would be compensable or not. Um, de again, depending on the state, the employee may have a pretty high bar to prove that's where I got it versus I got it in a subway, I got it in a store somewhere. Um, there's just there's, it, things, I, you know, a, a, uh, a pandemic like this there's just so many sources that you could get it. I, let me say, we, we have had employees uh, within Insperity's quarter million worksite employee base around the country who have made workers' compensation claims. One particular one that came up, no employee that he worked with had any signs of it at all. No one tested positive. They tested the entire workplace. But it so happened that this employee's, both his brother and sister, did have it and were hospitalized for it. I can tell you the claim from the carrier side was denied. Um, they, they are highly fact specific uh, situations. And, and then you said you were gonna tell me two ways, the second sure. 
good memory. Um, the other, and, and you know, highly unlikely, but did you, I guess you could have the possibility that your photographer employee went into the workplace, they had the disease and spread it, you know, and, and in some ways um, became the center of spread. In general, um, if someone were to try to make a claim like that, that's, that's what a general liability policy is for. Each general liability policy, you need to look at it in particular to see what kind of exclusions it had on it. Different insurers have sought to put forth, well, it's excluded by the pollution exclusion. Okay, well, this really isn't a pollution. Um, I mean, there, but there are a number of, of fact-specific, policy-specific issues that might come up in that. But in general, if someone made a claim like that, the first thing I would do is tell my general liability carrier, you need to defend this claim. Got it. Now, were you done with your presentation? I just threw a question right in because it seemed appropriate or shall I just fire away with some of the questions I've got? Well, let me just, let me go to a last screen for just a second. I, and I have stopped uh, sharing, have I not? You have. Then let me go back and share. And I'll invite but, anyone that has a specific question to type it into the chat. I just, there is a link up there at the top, insperity.com slash COVID-19 slash transitioning back to the workplace. I only put that link there because underneath it, you will see references to CDC sites, to OSHA sites, to EPA registered disinfectant sites. We have gathered all of those different sites and others at that Insperity COVID-19 transitioning back to the workplace site. So it, to the extent you want to do a deeper dive, you would like to have a, a single place, feel free to go to our site. The, the other way, you know, quite frankly, Google um, COVID-19 OSHA uh, return to the workplace. CDC cleaning and disinfecting. You will find these sites instantly. They are, they have gotten much better. Now it, by the end of June or the beginning of June, um, that each of these entities have developed fairly comprehensive sites. They are not hard to read. They're, they're not particularly long and there's a wealth of information there. The other thing I would say about these, especially the CDC and the OSHA piece of it, um, it, to the extent you are following their guidelines, it is, it, the lawyer in me says, nobody's going to successfully sue you it, because it, it, it and, and, I'm, and I'll use the qualifier successfully. I, I get for about 120 bucks and a few pieces of paper, somebody can sue you. I've, I've seen hundreds of them in my life, but one that could give you trouble, one that, that could get some traction. If you're following CDC recommendations, and again, they're not the world's highest bar. If you're following the OSHA recommendations, you're doing what you need to do as an employer and as a participant in your community. Let me stop Thank sharing you. that. Mark, go right ahead. All right, so I think uh, this one would be for you, Aaron. Um, working from home has been seamless for me and my team. How do I make my employees realize that on-premises is more effective? I've heard this question a couple times. How do I get them to come back? That's actually from me, Mark, from Leslie. Yes. Yeah. So Leslie, it's a, it's a great question and you're in good company because many, many have that same question. And, you know, I, I alluded to it just uh, earlier. I think the answer would be why. Why, why do you need them back or why do you prefer them back and, and sort of backing into that. Um, likely there's a business case somewhere or a business reason behind why you need that um, team back in the office. Is it um, because it's an, a an actual logistical reason where they're making something in a manufacturing environment, for example. You know, what's the purpose of bringing them back? Is it for social and camaraderie and, you know, building the culture? And, and, and if that's the case, I would, I would caution and just be mindful of our social interactions right now, if we're following the guidelines, are going to look different than they did before this all started, right? So that expectation of what that inner office collaboration would look like is going to be different. And, and, and making sure that you're 
having that in mind, if that's the sole purpose that you're wanting everybody back in office. If it's to monitor productivity and perhaps you don't have a system where um, you know, you feel in your gut like your employees are performing at the level that they should. Maybe they're not checking in. Maybe they're, you know, not visible on your inner office chat and they appear to be away all the time. That's a communication, a performance discussion. And, and you can outline and implement performance disciplinary action potentially um, or expectations tied to that position. So I you know, can certainly dig in deeper in terms of the why behind it, but I, I really do believe it, it boils back down to what is the reason that they need to be in the office? And does that have to happen now? Should it be a phased approach? Whereas Andy mentioned, maybe you're bringing people back intermittently or on a part-time schedule to manage that level of comfort and also productivity um, and take it step-by-step. If you don't mind, Leslie, I'm going to jump in and just add a little bit more. I am I am on the small group committee for Insperity, mm -hmm. corporate entity of of sort of making decisions about how do we reopen offices, um, who might be brought back, making travel decisions, who can travel, um, and and we have that this issue is one that we are really struggling with as a company. One of the things as I look across the the breadth of industries that each of you touch in some ways in Sparity, you know we are an office environment in general but we have a large sales component many of which have based their sales technique on making very good interpersonal relationships that were based around you know meeting in person um, Separately, we have a fairly large sales organization. Sal, do you like that I'm talking about your organization? Because I've thought about it a lot in the last few weeks. Um, we have a fairly large sales organization with some people who, who have been around for decades, have large books of business, large numbers of contacts, and they are continuing to be fed um, new opportunities. But we also have a fairly large population of very new people who, from our perspective, are selling a very challenging, complex product. They learn by being together and being close to one another and hearing other people talk about what it is Insperity does and the benefits that we bring. It, one of the things I think that we have figured out is different parts of our company may have a greater need to be back together sooner than other parts. And so part of that phasing is really taking a deep look at all of your different functions and asking that question. And, and to the extent the only answer you have is that's the way we've always done it, I, I challenge you, there will be a level deeper answer. There's often a very good answer for why we've always done it that way. But sometimes it may be, I can leave this entire group working remote for the next month the next three months, I could leave them there until 2021 and our, and our company won't miss a beat. But if I do that with this other group, on the other hand, you know, our sales pipeline just dries up. They, or the learning, the, the natural growth that needs to happen will just stop. So I, I only sort of go to that level and use us an example as an example. It, it can be very different. I have 25 safety professionals spread around the country. Um, there are times on a new prospect level, especially in a manufacturing setting, they need to go put eyes and ears on the site. It's hard to do that virtually. It's not impossible, but there's sometimes they just have to go see it. Um, I, I, I would assume it is hard to run a hotel in many respects, you know, virtually. You just can't. It, there's going to have to be some number of people there. Great. Thank you, Andy. Did that answer your question, Leslie? Yes, extremely helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, the next question says, should you require your staff to get a COVID-19 test prior to returning to work? And I would wonder from a legal standpoint, Andy, could you require them to get a COVID-19 test before going back to work? Because of the nature of a pandemic, um, there are a number of things that you can require, that you can engage uh, in, in dialogue about. 
um, that it's sort of in ordinary circumstances, you can't. Um, could you? Uh, by the way, this is a guess about New York law. Uh, so let me, let me just preface it. I am not licensed to practice in New York, and I'm not giving you legal advice for there. My, my instincts hypothetically. tell me. Hypothetically. Hypothetically, my instincts tell me you could. Um, the next real question you're going to have is a practical one, which is where are you going to do that, and are you going to trust the result? Um, it, which may be, to me, just as, or if not more important. Um, to the, you know, the, the, the question that will often come after that is, what about an antibody test? I mean, I would love to have essentially a passport that said, I've had the antibody test and I have the antibodies. I'm good. I can go anywhere. Um, okay, so how good was that test? And, and we are all, uh, you know, being challenged over the, the, the quality and quantity and availability of testing. Um, but if you had a place and you trusted it, um, you know, again, you, you might want to check with um, a, a, an HR professional in that area, an employment lawyer in that area. Uh, but my instinct says that you could. Now, there are also lots of other kinds of tests that you can perform um, on your employees, either as you reopen or every day. There are employers who are taking temperature tests every day. Um, I, I will tell you, it raises a host of issues. It, at one level, it sounds great. I'm going to go get my kids, thermo you know, forehead thermometer and my, my, you know, they're now teenagers and I don't use it anymore and I'll take it to work. Okay, well, how close are you going to get when you do that? At the tester all of a sudden becomes the backboard for a dozen or more people. Um, do they, what, what, you know, respiratory equipment, what face shield do they need to be wearing? Do they need to wear disposable clothes? I will tell you most um, safety experts and employment lawyers have said, if you're moving to testing, you need to think a whole lot more about the tester than taking the test. Separately, you then run into the, the privacy issues of test results. What do you do with them? Does somebody record them? I would generally say, please don't. <laughs> I mean, there's just, there's not a lot of upside to it. If somebody doesn't pass, you sort of now need to deal with that. Um, but other than that, you don't really care. Got it. Now, you said that maybe I should ask an HR professional in this area. I happen to know that. <laughs> Aaron, what do you think? I was just going to say, <laughs> to, to add to that, I, you know, and, and Andy took the words right out of my mouth, is what, what are you going to do? What is the intent behind implementing that as a practice? What are you going to do with that information? Because, um, you know, at the end of the day, under the ADA, you are still obligated to follow the, the HIPAA guidelines and, and the respect the, the privacy of that medical information that you now hold for your employee base. Um, so, you know, there is definitely a, a um, an increase and an uptick in, in EEOC claims tied to discriminatory behavior tied to COVID-19. And the EEOC anticipates that we'll continue to see that, whether it be a discriminatory decision based off of a layoff um, and or, you know, how are we implementing these screening measures and what are we doing with that information so it's something to tread very lightly on um, and certainly want to make sure that whatever practice is put in play that it's consistent across the the organization um, that there are good measures in place for the screener and the screenee <laughs> and um, that that you're that you have a, a a stance in terms of protecting the confidentiality of your employee base. Mark, I would say at the, the, the sort of backside of that, once you start to have people together, um, I think a real key for all of us is to, to identify the list of CDC symptoms. And if you see that in someone else, as an employer, you can then act on that. If you, if I had an employee that was 20 feet away from me, but was in a cubicle group and I heard them cough, I can tell you right now, everybody's ears perk up. One cough, they all sort of, well, okay, what was that? If I hear two or three, I'm likely to go have a conversation with that person. And part of it is, I just want to make sure I'm not trying to penalize you. I, I'm not trying to, 
to single you out or belittle you, but as an employer, you can react to that. You can isolate. In fact, you probably should isolate and you may need to send that person for testing um, and make sure they're good or they're separate from you working from home or in a different environment um, for some period of time before they come back in. Um, again, it, it, there's, a, there's a tension that goes on here between what I'm going to call the old rules and the public health rules. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, they're not always easy questions. And that's exactly it. I think any guidance that an HR professional or a legal counsel would give a business owner or leader would be to steer clear of that medical conversation in any capacity unless your employee is coming to you and asking you for some accommodation from the organization. In this case, it's different. So it may not be comfortable for people to feel empowered to go directly to that employee and ask if they're experiencing symptoms. Are they aware of what some of those symptoms of COVID-19 are and having that direct and honest conversation because it contradicts the normal guidance in, you know, uh, in, in addressing medical concerns around your employee. But the reality is you can and you're twin within your full right to be able to have those conversations and then to be able to ask the employee to stay home if they are experiencing symptoms, which again is not something that we're necessarily comfortable with. Um, but, but knowing that you are fully uh, able to have that conversation. So uh, I've had a couple questions about uh, commuting here, specifically in New York, because uh, a lot of people have to come in via subway or bus. So I guess the question would be, can I require my employees to come to work at this time, even if they, I know that the only way that they have to get here is through mass, trans, mass transit? So I'll, I'll take a stab at it from our end. Um, you know, it, it goes back to number one, what is their level of comfort in taking public transportation to get to work? Um, you know, ordinarily outside of COVID-19, it's not really the employer's responsibility to know how an employee gets to work. Their job is to know that they're there during the hours that they're expected to be. And we can't really get into the details of how someone gets there. But obviously this is a different circumstance. If it's absolutely crucial that this employee is deemed an essential employee and needs to come to work, you know, that's where that open dialogue comes into play. Are there any other accommodations or measures? Perhaps you're looking to supplement some of their, their pay. And so we've had clients with an disparity that are looking to potentially give some kickback to their employees to pay for parking, if that's an option for them. Um, do they really truly have to be in there? And, and what is their level of comfort? Because the, the reality is you, we don't have control. Metro North, and we spoke about this on our call yesterday, you know, during rush hour on a Metro North train, you can't social distance. Um, and, and that's really up to the employee to, to feel comfortable with, with being able to take that transportation to work and the employer understanding that there is greater risk and exposure in asking the employees to take that means of transportation and, and how essential is it that they are, that they are um, at, at work? Is there any potential workaround or accommodation to provide? Mark, the, the, I'm going to sort of go to the, everything Aaron said was, was dead on. Um, the, the issue that sometimes comes up is sort of the, the, at the extreme, what I'm going to call the can I? Aaron, I think, was um, answering perfectly the should I, um, the, the factors that one can, can consider. At the very extreme, the sort of legal can I, as a general rule, um, an employer, well, an employee doesn't have the right to refuse to work unless there is an immediate danger um, in their workplace. Um, it, you know, OSHA gives them, if you will, an out under the immediate danger um, uh, uh, status. The existence of uh, COVID-19 sort of in the vicinity is unlikely alone to, to meet that standard. So for instance, if someone were to make an OSHA complaint that, that was based on my employer made me come to work and 
you know, I know that COVID-19 is all over Manhattan. That's not going to be a basis of a COVID, of a, of a OSHA complaint that's going to get any traction. Um, and could you terminate someone's employment for that? The answer, could you, is probably yes. Should you? I, I, I think you can, everyone can hear, Aaron and I are, are saying, you know, success in this is having dialogue. Success in this is trying to figure out, is there another path? Is there some way that we can do this? On the other hand, there is a recognition that people need to run their businesses. They, they you know, income isn't just going to fall from heaven for the next six months. Yeah, and Mark, I think this is where, you know, you can, you can see firsthand in these questions and examples, there are a lot of things to take into consideration and a lot of pieces to, to weigh into your decision. And, you know, our recommendation is to find a, a trusted advisor during all of this, because there's so many moving parts from the employee and potential ADA accommodation to managing your business and what you need to do in order to get the business potentially back on the ground. And, you know, we recognize from A to Z what that, what that means. And, and so it's a matter of weighing out the risk versus reward in a lot of these scenarios. And ultimately, you know, keeping that culture piece in mind, because all of these smaller decisions of, you know, making an employee take the train or not, are going to spread like wildfire amongst your employee. And there's a, a resounding feeling against leadership in that in those decisions that are made and so you you know at a point where you want to 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 maintain your employees and you want them to feel it's a safe trusted place in order to get the ultimate productivity out of them those are all things to take into consideration great thank you I, i'd just like to add something not as a professional but, but as a small business advocate as Mark, as you well know, and you, you opened up with this, is when national sponsors of Vistage, and for good reason. I, I, I would consider both organizations small business advocates. I would consider both organizations um, mindful of the fact that of, of a mindset of uh, an entrepreneur with a getting better agenda. Um, we've been doing an awful lot of reach out. You saw the breadth of what we had up on the website, and you know Andy kind of shared. Anybody could go to that in kind of continuing that theme, and of course it's easy for me to, to say this because I'm gonna have to go to Erin and, and her team to back me up, but we frequently offer uh, free advice and, and we'd be more than happy to for your, for your member, member groups. Uh, should someone have a specific instance that we can help to kind of weigh the pros and cons of, as you can see, there's not a, there's not a concrete answer in a lot of these cases, even know this, knowing the specifics of the situation. But you know, certainly if there's, you know, as following to, up to this or um, other folks that weren't able to attend, if they had a specific question that they'd like us to weigh into, I'm going to offer that out to, to the group, uh, to your groups, actually, uh, to kind of come back to us and, and we'll do our best to help someone kind of weigh the pros and cons of any action that they're considering or certainly kind of set some strategic plans in place for the future. Thank you. Sorry, so Aaron. I'll have them reach out to you or Aaron or Andy or. Um, so to Aaron and I, Andy's, let's leave Andy at corporate. He's got to support an <laughs> awful lot of folks. If we need Andy, we'll go to Andy. Um, but I would say to Aaron and myself, um, because it might be something outside of Aaron. Aaron, as I said, there's five service teams. Aaron covers a specific geography, so um, and s certain industries and such like that. So if you hit us both, you're sure to get uh, an, an answer on that. Fair right. enough. Thank okay. you. That's very generous. I appreciate that. So my next question uh, is: What is the dialogue between us as a staffing agency and the people we place in the other companies in different states? Um, so I, I, I'm assuming that is one of the participants is asking that and they are a staffing agency. Correct. Okay. Um, the answer, I mean, it, the answer is going to be state specific. Um, as a general rule, I mean, one of the issues that comes up is sort of, are you an employer? And if so, have you obtained or maintaining workers' comp coverage? If you are, um, most states have a concept of a general and special employer, both of whom have 
what is known as exclusive remedy protection um, if, from an employee making a claim. Um, the, the, the general employer being the one that writes the paycheck, um, the, the, the special employer being the one that sometimes they're actually providing their services directly to. Um, but most states' workers' comp systems are structured in such a way that if an employee were to contract um, you know, this particular disease in the course and scope of their work, their only recourse is going to be through the comp system. Not, they didn't actually ask about comp in the question, I don't think, but at least from a liability management perspective, a good comp program is going to handle it if it's structured right. I think just to add to that, you know, I, I'm assuming as the staffing agency, as the employer, um, you are looking to implement your own guidelines or code of conduct around COVID-19 as you transition back into the workplace. And I guess I would, you know, I would kind of question how do you handle the normal code of conduct? So if you place, you, you I assume, would have one for the staffing agency and being an employee of, the, of that company. But then what are the expectations when that person is placed on site in terms of their behavior and how is that structured today? And it really should mirror you know, very similarly um, and, and be addressed in the same manner. So potentially having uh, meetings with those locations that you would be placing the individuals and, and just getting a sense of what their practices are that they're looking to put in place uh, around COVID-19 so that you can clearly communicate to the employees that you're placing what the expectations are and getting that buy-in ahead of time. The other potential direction uh, that, that the question may have been about or may have thought about is if a sta staffing agency placed one or more individuals into a work setting and the individuals that they placed um, were infected and then spread that disease in that workplace, could they have any liability back toward them? Maybe. I mean, I, it's one I haven't thought about a whole lot. Again, a lot of these communicable diseases, you know, trying to prove causation, someone trying to do that is going to be incredibly challenging because there's so many sources of it. You know, outside of if, um, you know, I, I'm going to use the classic Midwest meatpacking plant that is isolated, but a very large concentration of people. Pretty easy to, to make those determinations. But many others, there's just so many sources. Um, you know, a, a good GL policy, you know, if, to, to try to handle that kind of claim that doesn't have exclusions. Now, whether or not you could buy one today, that could be kind of challenging. People are going to be looking hard at those. Yes. So if a staff, if, if all staff are instructed to wear face masks in open office areas, it's a multi-part question. Is it necessary to have plexiglass barriers? I'll, I'll jump on that. Let me let me divide the 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 issues that are going on. Um, in, in some ways, in 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 the world of safety, there's something known as the hierarchy of controls. Some are better than others. Um, in many ways, and 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 you you have to identify what it is that I'm trying to prevent. Um, the primary spread of COVID-19 comes when people sneeze, cough, or breathe onto another person and small droplets lodge in a, in a mucous membrane. That is the, the primary way it's transmitted. It generally goes forward. It generally doesn't hang around very long. They, they're in bigger droplets. Those shields generally stop, and by the way, cubicle walls that are 60 inches or above um, and, and have people inside them, you know, offices that have doors on them, all are engineering controls in, in the safety vernacular that are, that are there to stop the spread uh, or will have the effect of stopping the spread of that particular, you know, expelling from the body. Um, masks, are, are a different kind of engineering control. 
Um, I, I will tell you that most people, once they get around people that they've been with for a long time, they find them uncomfortable and it's, and it's socially challenging, um, but they're performing in some ways the same function. They're knocking down things leaving your body. Um, you know, are they, and two, by the way, two is better than one. Um, but, but sometimes you just can't put enough plexiglass up or the particular operation, you know, plexiglass doesn't make sense in it. Um, it is, that is often a better solution, by the way, than six foot spreading without a mask. Um, the, the six foot, and there's lots of, you know, conversation and research going on. Is it six feet? Is it really three meters or 10 feet? You know, what is the right distance? Um, you know, how, how prolonged should the exposure be? Um, you know, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to really do all the great research to understand it with this virus. And so we're having to put in these intermittent um, uh, engineering controls, if you will. So the second part of that question is, if I require all my employees to wear face masks during the day, do I have to now have somebody on my staff that's like the face mask police? And if they take down their face mask, because somebody said they've noticed after the third day, all the face masks are on the chins or on the top of the heads, do they have to go run around and say, put your face mask on, put your face mask on? And if they don't, are they liable? Well, are they liable? That, that's, <clears throat> it, there's a whole other string of issues that are gonna come up on, in the are they liable? Um, because the person that gets it is gonna somehow have to be able to prove that's where they got it. Yeah. And then, then there's the question of liable for what? More than workers comp? Probably not. Um, now, you know, and I'll tell you in Sparity, corporately, we're going through that issue. A lot of it is, you know, people are grown adults and they can make decisions. I, I may know Sal fairly well. I know how Sal lives his life and Sal and I might feel just fine to go sit in a room three feet apart apart from each other, shake hands and have a drink. And, and I am, I'm a consenting adult and Sal's a consenting adult. And that may be an okay thing to do. Um, it, it, is, it is not perfect by CDC guidelines, but I'll tell you corporately, we've taken the position that, that we need to let people who want to maintain pure distancing have that. And if someone makes a choice to not do that, that they're a big enough adult to make that choice. Um, now, we don't let, we don't encourage it. We don't let packs hang out. But if two people, you know, we don't have the, the mask police. The flip side of it is if somebody encroaches and they're not wearing one, it's perfectly okay for someone to go to their supervisor or to say to that person, can you put your mask on? I don't feel comfortable. I mean, a lot of these are just different adult conversations, expressing what you feel. And, right. the, and you know the message is really around respect and that's the that's right. messaging to your employee as a as a leader every employee is going to have a different personal stance on where they fall in that line of comfort and that's okay as long as you're respecting that somebody is going to have a different stance and you're allowing them the the space and the freedom and the comfort to execute their you know, comfortability on it. And, and I think that's, that's the most important message for, from, the, from the leader um, is to be consistent on the respect factor because they're not gonna be able to control every single action that every employee makes at all times. So, you know, you drive yourself crazy trying to do that. Thank you. I have one last question unless somebody else typed something in the chat. You may have covered some of this, but it might be a good way to conclude too. What are the three best practices, implementations for bringing our staff back into the office environment? Uh, you know, I, I think to have a, a plan in place, um, whatever that means, based off of all that we just discussed, definitely putting a, a company stance in the position that you are taking in terms of some of those safety guidelines and regulations. So putting something pen to the paper to be able to communicate back to your employees 
What are your expectations? As you transition back into the workplace, this is what we are committing to you. We're gonna clean X amount of times. We've identified the you know, more um, high risk areas in terms of traffic pattern. And, and these are what, this is what we're doing. In exchange, we ask you to X, Y, and Z. Have that set guideline. Um, I think, you know, a best practice as, as gray as it seems is to have the, an open mind and to look at this in a completely different manner than you've managed your organization in the past, understanding that you're going to have to be more flexible. And with every fiber of your being, you may not want to be flexible with someone's schedule and it may not make sense, but this is where you're going to be challenged probably more than ever to to stretch it and to see if it works and be willing to give things a try. And if it doesn't work, you have a much better position in arguing, taking that back, but at least you tried. And in good faith, you know, gave your effort as an employer to work with the employee. Um, and I think, you know, the, the last thing would be to, to just gain that feedback from your employees, listen, listen to them, ask them, include them in every direction. You know, it's not a time to be um, dictating without any input. I, I think that it's really consistent across our client base where that's going a long way. Um, and I know I recognize that these best practices are, are not very concrete, but it's not a black and white scenario. And um, I just, I think it's all in the, the leadership and, and how you're portraying yourselves, um, which will dictate your employee's response and ultimate productivity. I don't know, Andy, if you would add anything more tactical to that. Just, uh, it, it's sort of a sub point under one of yours. And, and a lot of this may be dependent on the size of the organization. Um, but, but anything with a little bit of size, to the extent you involve others, you don't own all the decisions, but you bring others in, you form a small committee, that, that, and, and you, you task that committee with, we have to get back to work. We, we, in order for us to all have jobs, we must do that. But now let's solve the problems about what that's going to look like so that there is more ownership than just at the top. Um, separately to, to and, and again, Aaron and mentioned this, to accept that you're not going to have all the answers and to convey that, to be open about it with your employees. They're going to ask tough questions about what if this happens? You don't have to have the answer right then. None of us do. And we'll get through this. But, but you will not have all the answers right away. Some of them will just evolve over time. Well, Aaron, Andy, Sal, thank you very much. This has been super informative. I see some of the content, uh, uh, the chat comments are, it's been a fantastic presentation, very impressive. Thank you for putting this together. Thank you for your generosity today. I don't know if you have any final comments that you would like to make, but I'm very grateful. So thank you. Thank you. And just to add as to Sal's point, if there are any follow up, uh, it's not uncommon that we have sort of off the cuff conversations with the with the uh, just premise that it's hypothetical if we're not in a client relationship. However, um, best practice guidance is best practice and uh, happy to have those conversations if anything that you heard today sparks a, a follow up. Thank you. Aaron. Any Thank you for having us, guys. So? I, I was just so going to say that it's certainly our pleasure uh, to to do this. And uh, you know, when 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 I when I listen to Aaron, when I listen to Andy, it, it you know this this is a time where where when the chips are down, the the the, the you know, it's a time to step up, and it makes me very 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 proud to work with professionals like these two folks. Um, uh, you know, they're both extremely extremely busy. And you, as you well know, preparation is two to one in terms of this, this actual time spent with these folks. So um, I really want to step up and thank Aaron and Andy for taking the time and also for sharing uh, such, you know, so much of their expertise and their time with us. It's, it, it makes me very proud to be with Insperity. 
Thank you, Sal. Thank you. Thank you again. Thanks, Andy. Mark, for helping us to put this together. You're it's welcome. Bye-bye. Be safe, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.